So I'm the last guy standing between you and Bears. Um, some of you might expect Damien Tourneau here talking about distributed systems, but he pulled this talk two weeks ago, and during one of the track chair calls, I got pulled out as being his backup. So that's why today I'll be talking about uh, monitoring in an infrastructure, monitoring Drupal in an infrastructure as code age. If you feel like you're in the wrong talk and you don't want to see this, feel free to actually still leave. Because uh, I <laughs> kind of understand. If you feel that way in 10 minutes, you can also do, but please bring me a beer then. Um, so yeah, let me first introduce myself. I'm Chris Bautert. Um There's a fact out there. I'm not related to Dries. Um, but we do know each other since before Drupal existed. Um, ages ago, I used to be a software developer. I even wrote PHP. And then I became an operations person because I needed to deploy stuff and I was the guy constantly racking machines and putting stuff in production. Um, today my role is I'm the CTO of one of the larger open source consultancy firms in Europe. Um, we are Inuits, we have offices in uh, Belgium, the Netherlands and Kiev. Um, we do a lot of Drupal work but we're not a Drupal shop. So um, if I look at what I do today, I'm mostly building large-scale infrastructures, doing it the DevOps style. So doing continuous delivery, doing automated infrastructure. Who can tell me what DevOps is? This is DevOps track, guys. Who can tell me what DevOps is? Are you all afraid to reply to questions, or does nobody know? Who was in my talk last year? Okay, so nobody knows what DevOps is. Ah, two people, okay. Are you sure? Yeah, collaboration of operations and developers. Collaboration of operations and developers. Ah, I give that a 50% score. So this is what DevOps is to me. It's about culture. It's about how developers and operations people work together. It's about automation, and when we talk about automation, we mean automate all the things. We want to test automation, we want to automate the builds, we want to automate the deployments, we want to automate the monitoring. Basically, when we talk about automation, we think about infrastructure as code. And when we think about DevOps, we also think about monitoring, metrics, and all that stuff. And we also talk about sharing, and that's the CAMS, the CLAMS keyboard, which was coined by John Edwards, uh, Damon Edwards and John Willis, who have a podcast called DevOps Cafe. And the L, the influence of the lean movement, has been introduced by Gene Kim because he figured out, well, there's a lot of lean stuff in this and there's a lot of stuff which is based on. And it's also cool because if you had just the cams without the L in there, lots of people figured out, well, if you make an anagram out of it, it's just a scam, which it's absolutely not. So how many of you are Testing your Drupal code. Okay. Some of you. You have continuous integration. You have stuff where you actually put in place an environment where software is being pushed to production with a set of rules, with a set of checks which you want to succeed. And that's how big organizations work. That's how organizations work. They're afraid of pushing software into production and they wanna have tests in place that make sure that stuff goes the right way. But for some reason, on the infrastructure level, on the actual operating system level, we've been tolerating that people logged onto machines manually and started deploying stuff in there. We didn't allow the software developers to do that, but the infrastructure people, well, that was fine. So, with the advent of clouds and large-scale deployments, there's a lot of new tooling that came on the market, which allowed us to do this different. And that's basically what Infrastructure as Code is about. Infrastructure as Code makes us think again about how we build our infrastructures today. 
how we model it, how we can fastly reproduce the platform, and how we can basically have disaster recovery for free, the same way we build software. And if I look at a platform these days, um, there's a large part of that which I want completely reproducible. Think about it like Drupal core. Nobody's gonna touch this part, or three skills a kitty. And this part is completely in source code. Everything there, if I'm running a platform in production, acceptance or testing, it's identical. Then on top of that, I have a part where I give it an identity, like the sites directory where you basically give, this is the vhost, it's this site. You give it an identity with some specific configuration, enable these modules, and for the operating system, for the whole stack, it's pretty similar. You add some business rules, and the whole block down here, that's something which is in version control, which you can manage and which you can redeploy over and over and over again. You need some scale out maybe, you have some custom parts, but it's all automated. And that's something you can rebuild. The thing you need to add and the thing you need to back up is the actual user generated content. Because that's something which you cannot version, it's gonna be volatile, it's gonna change frequently. But the whole lower stack, you have to think and you have to start thinking about that as code and make sure it can be reproduced. Infrastructure as code also means that as infrastructure people are doing this, we need to start thinking as developers. I mean, I come from a development background, a lot of other people come from a development background, but we really think about our infrastructure as code. We have quality checks in there, we also use version control, we also use testing, we also use continuous integration and continuous delivery. And that means we build up our core infrastructure that way. We add the middleware deployment in this way. Apache, Solar, Nginx, all the components that are used to build a website. And we do this in an automated fashion. We do continuous delivery of the full stack. We enforce security rules in there. So we actually tune the parameters for the firewalls and all the stuff automatically. So when we deploy stuff, we deploy a host, a service, and the application with the monitoring, and that's the link to the monitoring part, configured automatically. So, monitoring. Who likes monitoring? Really? <laughs> I mean, about two years ago, John Vincent, Lucis on Twitter, was really fed up with all the monitoring things we were having. And he basically tweeted with the hashtag monitoring sucks. And he put up a Git repository, put in all the different tools he knew, and we pretty much started looking at what is out there, what tools are out there, what do we need to change, what's new, and, and how can we improve this thing, which is monitoring. Um, to me, basically, the Monitoring Sucks movement is a sub-movement of the DevOps movement. Uh, it's people who care about open source, who care about monitoring and improving the monitoring space in the open source world. And one of the reasons why Monitoring Sucks is, well, a lot of those tools are not built for scaling. They have a GUI which is, well, one page, and if I have 5,000 nodes, I'm gonna go page, page, page. Monitoring usually before the infrastructure of code age is something that was an afterthought. It was not in sync with reality. You had added four new services, but you never modified the actual monitoring config because it was all done manually. It was mostly targeted at monitoring a host. So you're monitoring your web server. It pings, Apache is running on it, and Nginx is running on it, but you're not actually monitoring all the different services on it because you don't have time to map that. There's maybe one default V host which you're monitoring, but all the other V hosts might have broken database connections and you're not monitoring that because it's manual. So the services sometimes are monitored, Apache, the, the actual application, never. And that basically ends up in chaos and monitoring not being done correctly. So fast forward a couple of months and at DevOps Days Rome, Ulf Manson from Recorded Future, he basically gave an Ignite talk about his newfound love for monitoring. He had found a way where he had 
integrated a bunch of new tools, in this case Sensu, and Nick Stila will be talking about Sensu tomorrow. And he started to find a newfound love for monitoring. So that ended up in we hosting monitoring hack sessions in our office. Um, people started organizing a dedicated conference about monitoring called Monitorama, which had its first event in Boston earlier this year. And the European event was in uh, Berlin last week, where yeah, Stenek was there. Ricardo was there, but he's not here. So there, there were people, a couple of people were there already from the Drupal community figuring out how to improve monitoring. So quickly, what's wrong with the current tools we were using? I mean, a lot of the tools were just not built to integrate with config management. They either had no API to talk to at all, or the API was completely broken, or it changed every time. They had absolutely no relation to scaling environments. And they were focusing on stuff we don't care about, like auto-detecting new services. We don't care about auto-detecting new services because we are defining them in code. Tools like Xenos, Subix, I don't know, does, does anybody use those? Um, yesterday, um, John Topper was talking about how he loves Subix. And I love Subix too, if I have a 20 node environment. Because once I reach 100 nodes, I need a full-time DBA to actually manage the database it's using. Uh, the same with Cacti, the same with other tools. Then there were tools that are using range robin databases like RRD tool, which is an awesome tool if you live in the 80s. But time series databases have evolved, and now it's much easier to actually create metrics and monitoring, and I'll come back to that later. So, there's a lot of tools which have been trying to do stuff good, but there's a new generation of tools out there which is gonna allow you to do stuff much flexible, much better. So we've defined infrastructure as code, we've defined why monitoring sucked and why we really wanna build something. So now the next question is, where do you start monitoring? So where do you start monitoring? What systems are you monitoring? I heard somebody say something. You monitor all the things. Indeed, you monitor from in development. You monitor your acceptance platform, your production platform. And a lot of organizations I work with, they only monitor production because that's all they care about. They have no idea about the load their application is generating in the test environment because they're not monitoring it. And also they only have, have one monitoring platform they don't have a test platform for their monitoring tools. So everything they try to monitor, they're actually breaking production life where they're doing it. And they're missing out on metrics because they're playing with their monitoring platform. So we really wanna have a feedback loop between developers and operations people as fast as possible in the development cycle. If a developer adds a new feature, if he creates a new view, I wanna see the metrics of the database and I wanna see that he created a slow query. And I want to know that the moment he actually does the commit and he, the moment he creates that view. If I only see that when he pushes it to production, I'm going to be about a week too late to tell him that, well, we need to add some indexes. Well, you know, the way you create that view, maybe we should do it different. And that's part what, from the lean movement. That's what DevOps is about. It's about creating a fast feedback loop between developers and operations so you get to know how the system works before it reaches production before you need to scale it to a thousand nodes. If you look at it from an architectural point of view, lots of the tools we don't like are big and bloated tools where they have everything in one and they think they can do it all. Think HP OpenView, think Tivoli, the typical enterprise tools. And a lot of the promising open source projects like Hyperic and Xenof, they try to emulate that, but it doesn't work. We need to take a step back and think about the good old Unix philosophy where you have a bunch of small components that are all really good at doing their job. And in that philosophy, we need to have tools that are capable of collecting metrics, transporting metrics to somewhere else. Typically, that's a queuing system. Maybe transform and change metrics like 
drop data we really don't care about. Then we need a third part where tools are actually doing the analytics, analyzing what's really going on and act on that. And of course, we also need to satisfy management, so we need to be able to build nice looking graphics so they can see, hey, we've got more users, and hey, we've got more revenue. So, how do we start doing that? The first thing we need to do when we build infrastructure as code is to start monitoring a baseline. Each time when we deploy a new host, which is gonna be part of our infrastructure, we're gonna automatically add the monitoring, we're gonna automatically add all the tools to do the collection, so it starts collecting the baseline. And we're also gonna add check definitions and update the monitoring tool. When we deploy a new node, the monitoring tool needs to know that a new node exists. So that kind of brings you to an architecture which looks like this. Who knows or who uses components in this architecture? Uh, I don't know if you can read it from the back, but there's basically, well, there, there's a bunch, this is a general overview. There's a lot of Java stuff in there, which you might interest if you're using Solar um, or Elasticsearch in the back. But if you look at basically the Apache stuff, then it's log sh shipping, it's monitoring from, for example, Nagios, um, as mentioned in one of the previous talks. And it's shipping, the light blue part is basically data collection, the darker blue part is data shipping, and then the green part is the actual tools that are storing the metrics and maybe doing stuff with it. And then the red part is actually reaction, what is happening on the platform. But this is a whole set of tools which you need to integrate. A bunch of them are still old school, like Nigel's, like Yakinga. Um, but a lot of them are from the new tools. So if you think about that in an infrastructure as code age, that means that the contrast is not good enough. This is an example how you could configure that in Puppet. Um, can we turn down the light maybe completely? Because Yeah. <laughs> okay, much better. So basically when, when you do that in, in, I have examples in Puppet, but you could do the same using Chef or uh, CF Engine or any other configuration management tool you want to use. Like John Topper said yesterday, the question is not about whether to use Chef or Puppet. The question is about use a tool and start automating stuff. So basically, when I define a host which is going to run an Apache instance, I usually have a meta class which is my way of installing Apache or our way of installing Apache. We include Apache, we include Motri write to do stuff, we install PHP, PHP with APC. Um, we basically configure the logging to go different, and we have the PHP class installed before we configure APC, because otherwise we cannot install that. And as I told you earlier, we have a baseline which already installs CollectD to do monitoring. We use CollectD for monitoring, for metrics collection. But on this host, since it's also running Apache, we configure the CollectD plugin to do Apache. Who knows CollectD? Okay, now I can't see anymore how many people are raising their hands. <laughs> so, CollectD is one of the tools which allows you to collect all kinds of metrics. Store them, centralize them, or ship them to a monitoring tool, ship them to a metrics tool. It's really good and it's really scalable to build these things. So when we define our Apache, we pretty much define how we configure Apache, with which parameters, that we want to get metrics from there, um, and that we also want to define the logging, because how many people do actually configure log rotation when they add new vhosts, when they add new files? Usually everybody forgets that, so the disks flood. We have that in there, and we have the firewall in there. Pretty much defining the full container of what the services are being built on in code. Reproducible, and if I need to deploy another service, it's fine. So that's the definition on one node. Now I've defined one config, and one node knows how this stuff works. Does anybody have an idea how to make this distributed? You see there's distributed content in this talk anyhow.
The example is Puppet, yeah. But it works with pretty much any other. Yeah, well, okay. So the Puppet architecture can be different ways. You can usually have a Puppet Master where there's catalogs being built, there's a client which connects to the Puppet Master says, hey, I'm Nodex, give me the configuration for Nodex. And the Puppet Master will then ship that. So Ricardo says, the Puppet Master will know. Well, yeah, the Puppet Master knows the definition of that node. It does not know what the node next to it is using. So we need to think about using a feature in Puppet which allows you to collect and store configurations for other nodes. And that's, for example, in Puppet language, that's stored configs. And the idea is there that you have a node which is running, which where you are including the Apache class, which then has a config which is going to store in a database. And when there's, for example, the Nagio server connecting, it's going to know from that database that there's five new nodes who have the Apache class installed, which it needs to start monitoring. Um, basically, that means you export a node with the at at resource, and you collect it with a spaceship. And this piece of code actually shows that. So we have we, we use a Kinga as a variant of um, Nagios um, for all kinds of fun reasons. Um, part of it is that the Nagios fork is the original Nagios build is pretty much going open core rather than open source, and development really isn't moving on. Uh, that's an example of how forks are really bad sometimes, but forks can also be good because the fork, the Kinga, is European-based. Those guys throw pretty good parties in Nuremberg, and they're actually improving and heading in a direction that people like. So on the server, we basically collect all the resources we've exported, and on the client, we're exporting them. And we do that for check ping, but also for the Apache stuff and for monitoring the host. So. In my Apache config, there's also this check, which we defined, because this is in my Apache class. And we check each time, when do you want to check, what do you want to check, and that code is being executed while we are collecting the data. So when I define a new Apache server, automatically Puppet will reconfigure Nagios, and it will relaunch it, and a new node will immediately be monitored. So. Infrastructure as code, what does it help us there? That we will be capable of knowing when new nodes appear and we don't need to do manual stuff. So quickly, if you look at the Kinga and at Nagios, um, I stole this afternoon, there's a bunch of plugins for both Drupal and for Nagios where you can check if there's updates missing, when you can see the health of your Drupal instance. And basically, those need to be there. You also want to check when the cron job has last been run. Uh, if there's long-running cron jobs and if they're not being blocking the platform. But that's a check we do by default when we export the Apache config. So the thing is, we are now monitoring not only Apache, but also every time we export a vhost, every time we deploy a new instance, we monitor the service. Yes, there was a question there? So, yes, you need to clean out nodes that disappear. Uh, in Puppet, that's basically Puppet node clean. And Nick Stila will be talking tomorrow about Sensu. Sensu is going to drastically take a different approach for that, but I'm not going to give his whole talk. There, there's, to me, two ways in using the monitoring tools. You stick with Nagios if you have an environment which is pretty fixed, which is only going to grow because it's easy to configure, there's a lot of community around it, and there's a lot of tools you can already reuse. If you are indeed running into an environment where I've got 200 nodes today, 30 tomorrow, there's gonna be 60 new ones popping up the day after, and three hours later, you're gonna have 5,000, then we start thinking about new architectures, and we start thinking about tools like Sensu. And if you're really interested in that kind of stuff, 
A lot of the approaches on how to configure that and the idea that you also need to do that as infrastructure as code, that still applies, but the tool is just being replaced. There you actually choose another tool like Sensu. Um, I think Nick will explain how to configure it with Chef, um, but the IDs are still the same. So, yeah, there's a couple of slides further on. Yeah. So, now we're both monitoring the actual application and Apache. So, for a lot of organizations, that is a huge achievement. Who of you is using Scrum in here? Oh, not too many. Weird. I'm used to talking to developers where they're pretty much only using Scrum as a development methodology. So you guys don't know what the definition of done is, right? Who knows what the definition of done is? Ricardo? No? So for a lot of people who think that DevOps is about introducing Scrum to systems people, we were really happy that we could include in the definition of done of a development team that it was actually monitored and in production. Because now, now we had actual software deployed which was monitored. And then, it's done, right? To me, a software project is not done until your last end user is dead until you don't run that application anymore. So, in which time zone do you need a wake up call at 5.28? <laughs> or is that not just going off? <laughs> so, software development has evolved. The way we deploy software is not in two week sprints anymore where there's new features at the end of the sprint, with monitoring included. No, software is constantly on, and we need to be able to monitor and make sure that as long as there's users, we know it's up and running. So I'm not a big fan of the definition of done in Scrum anymore. I actually want to get rid of it. But that also means that when you say you want to stop monitoring and you stop maintaining the application when your last end user is dead, you need to figure out if he's still alive. So how do you do that? I've been in a couple of setups where I was pretty much, we were practicing, well not even practicing, we were actually doing an upgrade. And so there's a distributed system where there's st stuff coming in on one side, there's API calls being made, and the server is sitting there, and we need to upgrade it. This was pre-continuous delivery. So you sit there next to the developers and they say, yeah, well, we're gonna plan the upgrade. Okay, sure, so when, when can we do it? Well, when there's no users anymore. How do you know? Well, we don't know, we check the Apache log. Okay, so you keep watching the Apache log for four minutes and then there's one new hit. So there's one user. Who is this? Can we kill him off? Can we shut him off? That's one approach. You wait till there's actually nobody there anymore. The other approach is, well, we put a firewall in place, it's gonna error stuff and it's gonna break stuff. But the actual way to do this is measure all the things, which is one of the DevOps mantras. We really wanna measure all the things. And sometimes we even measure too much. But the thing is, you can throw metrics away afterwards, but you cannot recreate them. You cannot reinvent metrics. So, we start measuring and monitoring stuff from within the beginning. We want to measure deployment statistics. Um, oh, I was actually going to replace this screenshot with the actual front-end deploys of one of our Drupal sites we're doing. But basically, we, we use a tool called Graphite. Um, Graphite, who, who uses Graphite? Okay, four people. Um, for the others, Graphite is awesome. It's a Next generation time series database. It's scalable, unlike stuff like Cacti and Munin. And it's, I mean, every developer in this room can send metrics to Graphite. You open a socket to port 2003 and basically send a timestamp, a name, and a value. And that's it. Who cannot write that in PHP? You're not a PHP developer. Okay. <laughs> 
then write it in shell, use netcat, whatever. It's so trivial. And what we do when we deploy new software is we basically send a null metric. And Graphite allows us to draw a line as infinite on every null metric. And what it also does is this gives you a point in time where new software has been deployed. And when you map that to the actual behavior of the application, you can go back and talk to the developer and say, you know, last Monday at 5 p.m. we deployed this new feature from your git commit. And they'll say, yeah, that's right. And after that, our database queries went up to 20,000 per second. What the fuck did you do? And they'll be like, uh, well, I enabled the debug parameter. And they'll disable it, and you'll exactly see when they introduce the fix, and they'll all be happy again. So, what do you want a metrics of? You want metrics of a lot of stuff. You want to be able to know when you can pull the application down. So you want metrics on the actual concurrent users, and not the ones you see in the Drupal dashboard. Um, you want to see if you're running a service, the number of signups you're having, the response time of your service. You want to see if you have documents being generated or queued. You want to see how fast they actually go through your usage. You want to see how many times people have restarted Nginx and PHP FPM. Because people do that behind your back. Because it's unstable by nature. And you want to figure out with your team, with your management, what's actually specifically valuable for your specific application. And that brings you to the next point where you can actually build self-service metrics, where if your developer is interested in the number of times he does a certain operation, you just let him send metrics. and You just let him build his own dashboard. And he also will be wanting to look at all the Drupal errors logs, over 25 sites correlated. So we need to give him tools which allow him to learn from his existing platform. And there's another tool I like to use for that, and that's called Logstash. Who knows Logstash? Who's using Logstash? Okay. So Logstash is a tool written by Jordan Cicel. And Jordan is a guy who does anger-driven development. If he doesn't like something, if he's frustrated with something, he writes a tool to fix that. And trust me, he has written a lot of tools, maybe a bit too much. And every month I figure out that he written another tool, uh, even last week. And Logstash can collect software and metric, can collect log files from everywhere. And if you, if you see in the top corner there, it actually gets metrics from Drupal logs. It actually knows how to understand and parse those. Um, default, it can also get stuff from uh, log4j or Apache or syslog. Whatever format it has, it knows. It can do some filtering on that, so throw away stuff. Think back about the queuing, about the small tools I mentioned that are capable of doing cool stuff. And then it can store that into a lot of tools. Now the default tool where people want to store things in is Elasticsearch. Who knows Elasticsearch? Who has learned the tool here up till this? So Elasticsearch is, think about it as the next generation of solar. Not really 100% correct, but it's in that direction. It, it allows you to really search fast in your data. It's scalable, it's clusterable. And if you have Elasticsearch with a Kibana dashboard for your logs, you can actually have people search a distributed set of log files much faster. And it will also give you the opportunity to build metrics out of those logs. Because one of the things that's in here as an output is graphite. The exact same tool I used before. So if you want to know how many times there's failed user logins on your site, you can find that. If you want to find how many times Mollum actually did not scan correctly and didn't catch your spam, you can get graphs out of that, better than the ones on the Mollum site. If you want to see how many times you got a captcha because somebody tried to spam something, you actually can build those metrics on your own dashboards, and you can also integrate that with all the other error messages and all the messages in your system. 
Um, there's another way to do that. There's a Drupal module which allows you to ship stuff to Logstash. So anyhow you want to use it, you want to use the log files from Drupal, send them to syslog, or use this module, or use the plugin where it does it, where it grabs the logs from the database. There's no excuse not to ship those logs centrally and to correlate them. People have been doing this on a lot of sites before. So now you have metrics. You have numbers and figures, and you want to get statistics out of this. And then there's a tool called StatsD, which is basically a tool written by the guys from Etsy. It has been written in all kinds of languages, and it does the simple math for you. This is an example of an Apache log, and the events correlated to that. So here you see the graphs of how many events were there. StatsD will build that for you. It will ship it to Graphite, and your developers then can build new dashboards. Because Graphite also has an API. This thing in the top, it's basically something you can build up from within PHP code. And people then can start building their own dashboards and start sharing things they want. There's, surprise, surprise, also a Drupal module to directly send stuff to StatsD. And this sends stuff to StatsD. StatsD flushes its metrics to Graphite. So this is basically a metric from a Drupal site generated right into my Graphite system. So now I have a lot of metrics. Now I have a lot of things to play with. What's the next step? Do something with it. And what do you want to do with it? Um, I saw a slide this afternoon where there was a metric of the disk usage and a threshold about, well, if you reach this part, you're going to be screwed. Frankly, I don't care about that anymore. What I want to know is the speed my disk usage changes. Because I'll know up front my disk usage is going to reach a certain limit. And I know when my site is active that it's going to be in four weeks. But when suddenly activity changes and there's a huge change in the normal growth or even a huge drop in the normal load, that's when something's going wrong. That's when there's a real anomaly in your platform. So it's time to go back to our math books and read all this stuff about um, acceleration and all that stuff, and even go a step further to actual statistics. Graphite allows you to do a lot of these things. It allows you to map things on what happened last week. It allows you to do forecasts. It allows you to do all the stuff that statisticians are really fun with. And, well, if there's such a huge drop in your system, you also want to get an alert on that. So we have basically, and this is an example on how to do that on a, on a Java GMX, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so this is basically uh, an example, but it could be used for any other metric. If you see a certain drop, you can check that on the graphs, and you can trigger a notches alert based on that, that drop. Or if you have a system where you basically, if it's, well, as long as over the past 50 minutes, we stay over that load, or the past half hour, we stay over those actions, it's fine. But if it keeps longer, and we learn that from the graphs, then there's an issue. And they're the same, we can trigger basically alerts on those graphs. Um, this code snippet isn't that interesting for you guys. So we have monitoring, which is automated. We have metrics from the monitoring, from the other usage, from the platforms. And we build dashboards with that. Dashboards which the developers can self-service from, where they can learn and add new stuff. But also stuff which we care about, like MySQL replication lag. And one of the tools that allows you to build those dashboards, there's plenty of them out there, but this is an example using GDash. It's just a simple templating engine which allows you to write the metrics on one line which you want. And this is something you can then template and give to developers. 
and they can start building their own dashboards and sharing metrics. So what's the next thing people need to do? They want to start learning from that data. They want to start actually do machine learning and big data analytics on those platforms. And a lot of the large-scale sites are already doing this. If they're doing an e-commerce shop, they really want to see the forecast of what's going to happen, and that's where machine learning is going to come in. And then we're down to the last part in camps. It's about sharing. And part of the sharing is visualizing it. Visualizing the revenue, visualizing the sales turnover, visualizing the signups. And part of the sharing is basically doing that on dashboards. And this is then the screenshot of one of those dashboards you can build with Graphite and GDash. And a nice story on that part is sharing these dashboards, like in the coffee room or lunch room, where everybody sits together, where everybody meets. CEOs will walk by the dashboard and figure out what is that spike. And they'll talk to the operations people and they'll talk to developers what happened here. And you create discussion, you share experiences. And sharing experiences, that's also what DevOps is about and what a lot of people are doing in this DevOps track. And the thing I want you guys to share now is your feedback. That was basically my message to you today. Any questions? Nobody wants to know where the beer is? Okay. Well, thank you.